Hey, Growing Perilous fans, this is Daniel Fox. I'm back for part two of the Mongosh walkthrough. Uh, you'll notice there's probably a change, change of scenery here. I'm actually at my house, and you can see this giant, uh, busy, dirty table. This is actually my our game room here downstairs uh, that you're seeing with our setup and all that good stuff, um, including our Zweihander table, uh, because it feels appropriate uh, for what we're gonna be going through today for Mongosh. Um, you'll probably notice a few things in the background. Uh, first off, you're going to see the Dan Mandich exclusive cover for Mongosh that was done for our Kickstarter. Um, this is not available anywhere. Uh, this is strictly for Kickstarter. We're not selling this through Angels of Media Universal. And of course we have our special edition. That's a foil cover with, uh, Skeever Tech's Lexitone, uh, cover. This is only available for Kickstarter as well. Uh, we may do a reprint eventually, uh, depending on demand, but you know, for now, um, we have this right here, this beautiful, amazing book, the cover done by Ken Duquette, the lab done by Ken Duquette and Sierra Stanton. It's a beautiful, amazing book, Mongosh, uh, which is a supplement, a chaos supplement specifically for Zweihander RPG. And as we spoke about before, uh, there's a lot more to Mongosh than simply just a bunch of demonic magic and chaos. There's actually quite a few new things. Um, in fact, we're looking here now where we last left off at Liber Armorum, which translates from Latin to uh, Book of Armor, Book of Weapons, Book of Good Stuff. And this includes a lot of weapons we wanted to originally put in Zweihander. Um, we just couldn't fit it in the main book. I mean, if you've seen the, the revised core rule book, you know, it's pretty beefy. I mean, it's 4.2 pounds, 669 pages. Um, and, and there's stuff that we couldn't fit into it. Uh, you know, this kind of became, this actually got put into a Google Drive folder. The kind of origin of Mongosh, I'll actually speak a little about that for a moment before I dive back in. Um, whenever I was writing it, uh, we had a lot of stuff that was left over, things that we had to leave on the table that just wasn't, was too much for Zweihander. We had too much, too much content. Um, and we really didn't want to break the book up. Uh, so we said, okay, what's appropriate for Zweihander? What's appropriate for another book? So everything we kind of peeled out, we, 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 we created um, Dark Astral, which is a little 36-page print of man thing that was kind of leftovers from the Game Master section. And eventually it kind of started this file system in Google Drive we called, you know, our left-handed path. And, and, and in essence, it eventually came, became Mongosh, which means, you know, left-handed dagger. Um, and of course, because this book is full of chaos and stuff like that, uh, it felt appropriate to name it that. So that thus its namesake, Mongosh. And that's why we produced this other book, because we just had some stuff that was left over. Plus, we had a lot of things that weren't quite realized yet in Zweihander we wanted to do. Um, expand out vehicle combat, a number of new professions, other types of magic, and we decided this is where it sits. It lives in this book here, Mongosh, uh, and that's where it began about a year, year and a half ago or so when we started writing this and pulling it together. Um, our supplement came very quickly actually after Zweihander. Zweihander came out, I believe, 2000. 18, it would have been in March or April when we first delivered it. Of course, we're doing we're doing our reprint now, which is already yeah, as of a month and a half ago. It's behind our and Perilous revised core cool rule book. Um, and Mongosh came out, you know, it's about a year and a few months afterward. So we came out with a supplement pretty quickly because we knew we just had all this cool material that we really wanted to capture uh, in a book. But we wanted to adhere to the same bounded accuracy model as Zweihander. We wanted it to be well balanced. We wanted it to be thematic, um, and thematic is is kind of what it ended up being, like a lot of chaos magic and stuff. But of course, there's other things that we, you know, like I said, we peeled away from Zweihander because it just wasn't quite appropriate for Zweihander. And Libra Amorum is kind of part of that. So as we dive in, there's more artwork. Obviously, full page artwork always on the left hand side as a chapter start done by. Uh, Dan Mandich and the layout is done by Ken Duquette. Um, really nice. You can see the CP tones kind of coming out here. And this is where we start to talk about like availability of goods. So cities will have weapons and armor and other things more readily available than say towns or villages. And in fact, as a game master, you can pretty much kind of count on how you're going to multiply your prices out, what's available as is in the book, how much more it'll cost. As an example, uh, cities pretty much have everything, just standard, you know, as is in the book, priced out by gold crowns, silver shillings, and brass pennies. But cities are obviously larger fields, larger communities have more, more traffic, more merchants, more people coming in and out. 
So towns are kind of the next step down. And you'll see in towns that pretty much anything with silver shillings or brass pennies can be priced as is, but items in gold crowns may be two times or more based on what the game master decides. So it kind of creates this interesting economy uh, where a game master can say, oh, well, if you're in a village, uh, there's nothing really in gold crowns or silver shillings, but anything in brass pennies in the book, yeah, you could buy that as is. So it's a quick, easy way that's elegant for a game master or player to quickly communicate the cost of items as opposed to like, well, is there war in the area? And how much is the cost of grain? And all these other kind of finicky rules that some games introduce. We wanted to make it very, very simple. So cities, towns, and villages define that. We now move on to new materials and craftsmanship. And this is actually an extension uh, from Zweihander. This is developed well after Zweihander because it felt like we were kind of missing some stuff like we didn't have iron wood, and how much does iron cost? And what about steel? And what about bronze and coal iron and clear bouillie and and meteoric iron and mithril? And we just decided, like, hey, let's let's develop a subsystem for it. Let's include it in Zweihander, or sorry, Mongosh, and let's talk about what that actually means. So if we go back to Zweihander on page 236, you can see materials and craftsmanship covers poor materials normal materials, and best materials, which are the Castle Forge quality. We kind of blow that out and say, well, what's it mean when a weapon is made of bronze? Well, in this case, if a weapon of, uh, or shield is made of bronze and critically fails to parry, it's ruined. If it's armor and you are stuck by a crit success from the melee attack, the armor is ruined as well. So it kind of gives an interesting kind of way to tweak weapons. Of course, cost for bronze is significantly less, two-thirds, uh, as we can see here. Um, but moving on, you can see cold iron. Cold iron is important because cold iron can be treated as if it was made the benefactor of anoint weapons. So basically, if you want to strike creatures that require magical weapons in traditional kind of like RPG tropish ways, you've got that, which is really cool. We have iron, obviously, queer bouillie. We've got ironwood, which is uh, in my game is wood that's partially petrified trees, which uh, increases distance by six yards for for bows and strung range weapons that are made from it, so crossbows, bows, and the like, um, slings perhaps. Uh, meteoric iron, so that's iron that has fallen from the sky and has been turned into new weapons, uh, which gives some interesting things when they injure foes or reduce injuries. And of course, uh, our example about that actually we use Duker von Klud. Um, this is another call out from Adam Kobel actually. When he first did character creation in Zweihander uh, on his channel, he created this geriatric gnome, one-footed gnome pit fighter. And she was elderly, named Duger von Klud. And so we included her in there because, you know, Adam's a good friend and um, it just, it just, you know, we try to include our friends in all of our books. Um, nonetheless, moving on, we have Mithril, of course. Now, Mithril is unique because mithril, you can't necessarily make things of mithril, mithril strictly. Instead, you bond the mithril to the weapon. There isn't like actual true like hardened ingots of mithril. Instead, you're taking like these threads of mithril and weaving it around the weapons or armor. So it's a little bit different, but you have to use the ritual of bond mithril, uh, which is actually covered here in, in Mongosh later on to actually craft things of mithril. Obviously steel, you know, you get things that are made of steel, they're just a touch more expensive. Uh, they're two times the normal price of what's in the book. But um, anything that you made uh, make of it, it reduces the encumbrance value by one. So that's pretty cool. So it means like if you have a Zweihander made of steel, as opposed to weighing, if we go back here in Zweihander book, which is apropos, we can see our Zweihander weapon has an encumbrance value of three. So if you made the Zweihander, of steel, it would have an increment value of one. And of course, these are all unique materials. You really can't layer them together. So you're not necessarily making something that's uh, mithril and steel, but you may make something that is potentially, looking back at Zwei Hunter, perhaps it is castle forged, has a maker's mark, right? And is also made of mithril or steel or whatever else it may be. So special materials basically allow you to expand a crafting system that was already proposed in Zweihander. A very simple crafting system in the back of trappings, uh, in the back of this chapter here. But of course we're talking about Mongosh, so I'll, I'll keep focused there. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so there's a ton of new weapons. And as you know, in Zweihander and now Mongosh, 
Weapons are not defined by the different damage dice type they use, but they actually use a, a number of qualities, and those qualities define how that weapon works. So, flaming arrows and other weapons, total aside. Uh, if we go through all of this, you're going to see weapons like a backsword and a barbed spear and a bohemian ear spoon and a glaive and a, and a halberd and a kautzbalger and a military fork and a sparthax and a tool war and a rumi and bulge. They all do the same damage. However, their qualities, like finesse, light, and vicious, if it's a lot of weapons, finesse, it utilizes the agility bonus as opposed to combat bonus for damage. If it's light, that means it adds plus one damage when held off the offhand. And vicious means it actually roll more chaos dice to determine if you injure, injure a foe when they go down the damage condition track. So these combination of qualities are what really define the differences in weapons, which is a unique approach because we, we wanted to simplify things. However, there are clearly... Game Masters, oh look at this, here's this big beautiful piece of artwork that shows all the different weapons in the book. If a Game Master wants to use just other types of damage, they can absolutely do that. They're not using alternative dice, they're using alternative damage values. Like as opposed to saying a backsword does agility bonus, this does agility bonus plus one, and Barb Spears combat bonus plus one, and Back to Corbin's combat bonus plus two, and so on and so forth. So you have an alternative damage system inherently built into both Zweihander and Mongosh. Uh, that you can utilize uh, as a game master. And um, it's entirely up to the game master. It's up to you all. It's up to the players. It's up to what you all like to use your games in your games. So we're now on page 106, and I'm rambling, I think, <laughs> talking about weapons. But more simple melee weapons. The Basilar, the Bollock Dagger, the Cat of Nine Tails, the Cestus, or Kaistus, I think is how it's pronounced uh, in the original Greek. Um, sword sticks, scythes, sickles, pitchforks, pilgrims, staff, kopesh, foil, trident dagger, all kinds of really cool new weapons in here. Flamard, rapier, uh, some really, really cool things that, um, of course, as we are ought to do, or I should say as I'm ought to write, the ball, I write clever stuff in there because I'm a child of pop culture, like I said, you know, bollock dagger. They say it's not the size of the dagger, but the way you use it. So named for its phallic-like shape, the bollock dagger has been used for both clean kills and unsanitary penetrative means. The Bollock Dagger is actually a historic weapon and it does in fact look like, wait for it, a pair of dick and balls. And it was intentional in the weapon's creation. Uh, so it sounded kind of like an interesting fit for us. Uh, Pupu Kaka humor always appealing, I suppose, to some degree. Um, but obviously we've got a number of other weapons like the Pitchfork and the Scythe and Sickle and Swagger Stick and Trident and so on and so forth, and the War Chopper. But we also go on to new range weapons, like the, the Blowpipe. Now we spoke earlier about qualities defines what, what these weapons do. So if we look over uh, back at the, the uh, actually I have to go forward here a little bit. Here we go. If we look at the Blowpipe, it's fast, means it's a minus 10 base chance to dodge or parry. It's ineffective, meaning it does zero damage, nothing. Um, and it's throwing, so it only relies on a short range. However, you can use that to fire poison darts. And there's a ton of poisons, both in Zweihander and new ones in Mongosh as well that we will talk about as we get to move forward. Uh, you know, obviously in our last in our last video, we spoke about the, the Blitzballer. Pigskin is in fact a weapon uh, because it's kind of funny and it's, you know, got iron on it and stuff. Um, anywho. Moving on, we've got a bunch of new types of weapons like the Throwing Star and Witchfire Gisele. And we, you know about Witchfire because it's the green stone that can be pulverized and turned in for rituals. It can be used to create, you know, elixirs, panaceas, and various other things. But it can also be used to create Witchfire weapons, which basically explode upon contact. So the Gisele is obviously a long rifle. A pistol is pretty obvious. The Witchfire Thrower, well, that's a little bit like, uh, as you can kind of think, it's a giant flamethrower made of burning green gas. Yes, we do kind of address some interesting, I wouldn't call it steampunk, but we kind of softly address it as witch punk because Witchfire can also be used to pilot fantastic vehicles, which we'll talk about later on. Um, but moving on, we've got ring mail armor, scale armor, mantles that you can use to to basically blind people with temporarily. We've got the crazy looking lantern shield, a real sh historic shield, crazy looking. A pavise, unrimmed shields, and so on and so forth. And of course we have all the stats for that. 
And this kind of dives into all of the actual types of armor and new stuff that you can do and all that jazz. So now you move to war machines. And war machines, as you well know, are bolt throwers, stone throwers, siege weapons, trebuchets. We've got a few new ones in here. And you can see the picture of what they are. The Demi Culverin, the Rebalquin, the Puckle Gun, or Pickle Gun, <laughs> as we were odd to call it sometimes. It shoots pickles. Um, the Battering Ram and Powder Kegs. So uh, this talks about how you use them in combat because they can do damage. So uh, that concludes Liber Armorum. And now we're going to dive into Liber Vehiculorum, so Book of Vehicles. This is maybe my favorite part of this entire book. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background on this. So we've had in our own games horse chases, people chasing after each one another in carriages, coaches to the city. And we never really had a subsystem that was easy to use in the game to address what happens when you're racing these vehicles down the streets and crash into one another and all this crazy stuff. And of course, as you're seeing this image, and once again, it's by Dan Mandich, this beautiful, amazing piece of artwork. But we wanted to create a subsystem for it. So we created some vehicle combat rules, but we'll, and we're gonna talk about that here in Libra Vehiculorum. But first we're gonna talk about bottled lightning because fantastic machines use them to power them. So fantastic machines may include the Arkwright Cauldron, basically an engine that's powered by Witchstone. Um, bottled lightning, which is created by natural philosophers as a fuel for these engines. And of course we have how you create bottled lightning if you're an alchemist. There's all these, we always have recipes for everything in all of our games because you can't just have one thing and say, well, you buy it. Instead, we want to empower people to make their own stuff. So you can create bottled lightning using Witchstone. Obviously we have a difference engine. And if you don't know what a difference engine is, it's like this. It's, it's, it's a giant calculator. Um, and uh, it's powered by, you guessed it, Witchstone or where bottled lightning. We have the Hal Davinson, a one-man automated velocipede. Sometimes they have two wheels, sometimes they don't. They're motorcycles. The Iron Horse, which is uh, unmanned carriages that are laden with cargo, and when they are hooked together, they're called a gestalt. So essentially, it's your kind of rudimentary train. We have juggernaut frigates, which are basically kind of semi-submarine war galleys that are armored and um, can descend below the water. We have the Kugelpanzer, which looks like a wooden beer keg split in half, set up on elliptical track, and uses an Arkwright cauldron. We've actually got a picture, well, bam, right there, of that crazy looking Kugelpanzer, or, uh, you know, a, a wheel of doom. It's crazy looking, uh, but it's powered by Witchstone as well, and looks kind of incredibly frightening. And in fact, if you look here, we've got a gray Vivimancer from our previous video actually piloting this thing. Um, and some of the Skurzak in the background, some interesting stuff going on. Uh, the next fantastic vehicle is a rumble, rumble butler, so basically a horseless carriage. And we looked before, we heard before in our profession called the, the Barnstormer. Barnstormers are really good at like driving these crazy vehicles. Um, along with that, we have some other fantastic machines like torch lamps. So torch lamps are kind of like gas lights that burn with bottled lightning. And that's kind of cool. And of course we have Zeppelins, so aerostats that are born in the air that lays atop the world. So we would be terribly remiss if we didn't include vehicle qualities because every vehicle is different. As you can see here, they're all very different in how many drivers they require and passengers they support and the operate skill that you use to drive or pilot it. Um, the qualities it contains, the movement values, the size modifiers for armor and damage, the horsepower, meaning how many horse it requires to pull. Um, as an example, obviously, you know, Arkwright cauldrons and bottle lightning are not vehicles. We include the prices regardless. However, like Hal Davinson's in Kugelpanzer and Rommel Butler, um, in, in, they all utilize, they use, utilize bottle lightning, so they have no horsepower. Um, but uh, we start talking about like what those things mean, like something with the sub out of hell uh, can use the gun it action for one less AP. Gun it is an action in combat you can use while in a vehicle. And I'm going to break that down here soon to talk about what that really means, because I think you'll find it's incredibly, incredibly familiar um, and easy to use because it utilizes actions in combat just like the rest of combat does in Zweihander. So moving on. Here's the different types of chariots and wagons. Most of these are already spelt out 
in Zweihander, but we included a big spread of images just to kind of show what they look like. Um, we want to show what they kind of look like in the national environment. Um, obviously, you have stagecoaches and war wagons. We include some miscellaneous rules for lifting, pushing, and pulling, how much you can lift by encumbrance and pull and fun stuff like that. I mean, not necessarily incredibly important, certainly optional as any rule is, I suppose. You know, you as a game master and the players will decide what you want to use. And once again, this book is meant for everybody around the table. It's not just game masters, it's players as well. In fact, most of the options in here are for players. So players, I think, will get a kick out of what's included in here. Um, we also go into steeds, how much encumbrance they support, how quickly they move, different types so you can ride and buy and all that fun stuff because people will fight on the horseback. And we've got a subsystem created for that now. Um, here's some additional horses, another spread showing all the different horse types. And here's one of those crazy Hal Diamondsons. This is almost like something out of Warcraft to some degree, I suppose. But this is actually the start of our vehicle combat system. Now, vehicle combat, uh, as I mentioned before, it is action point based. So it slides right in to the combat chapter of Zweihander. You have new actions of combat you can use as a driver, um, including a few kind of interesting rules if you're on the vehicle and striking other, other foes. But if you remember back here in Zweihander, there are actions of combat that you use, like attacking, moving, perilous stunts, inspiring other people, whatnot, that's broken down by movement actions, attack actions, perilous stunts, special actions, reactions. Same here, movement actions. Bootleg turn, go real fast, make a 180 degree turn. Change speed, speed up, slow down. Gun it, go real quick, stop, stop your vehicle. Collide, basically crashing into other vehicles. Brake checks, like a perilous stunt you can use with a, with a vehicle. Um, like if, if you do a brake check and they fail their test, they're rattled. They, they may they start with one less AP until they make a successful operate check. So basically you can cast, you can use parallel stunts against them. You can sideswipe their vehicles. You can swerve around to avoid uh, being struck. You can jink your vehicle back and forth and you can run over foes. So um, all of these have their own unique kind of uh, quirks about them, how they work just like just like in Zweihander with actions in the combat. There's our rumble, rumble Butler, by the way. A horseless carriage powered by bubble lightning and a arc rate cauldron. Um, what happens when you lose control of your vehicles? All kinds of different things you can use in other Kugel Panzer. Momentum dice. Uh, vehicles don't use 1d6 fury dice. They use 1d10 momentum dice. They don't explode, but they do a ton of damage. So if you get hit by a vehicle, you're pretty much gonna hurt but this is really intended not only for just vehicle to vehicle combat meaning taking two carriages and crashing them into one another but also what means what it means is a passenger to fight atop a vehicle in the middle of vehicle combat a driver can utilize all of these new actions in combat and passengers can still do all their host of actions but they're just a little bit different so in vehicle combat, it's not necessarily just you crashing your chariot into another. It's about you crashing your chariot and piloting it along the side and colliding and having your friends jump atop the other vehicle and attacking with their weapons. And of course, we talk about what all that means in an expanded guide to vehicle combat, just like we walk through uh, when you make uh, an attack in Zweihander, like we using your attack actions have kind of a breakdown. Uh, vehicle combat has the same thing. Like how you do all that as a driver of a vehicle and what some of those sample difficulty ratings may look like. We talk about whatever other happens, like when you use different things to evade, like jink or how you roll damage and calculating additional damage threshold. But we also talk about vehicle conditions because much like player characters who have damage condition tracks, vehicles have a vehicle condition track. Um, and as vehicles get you know, broken up, lightly, moderately, seriously, grievously, smashed, and eventually wrecked, mishaps happen. Just like when a character in Zweihander suffers injuries, vehicles will suffer mishaps that communicate what happens to the vehicle. And there are moderate mishaps, just like moderate injuries, serious mishaps, just like serious injuries, and grievous mishaps, just like grievous injuries. And, you know, of course, the bottom, the ones at the bottom are always the worst, like fatal crash, you and everything is dead. <laughs> you know, there's a one in 300 chance of that happening. But, you know, there's all these different things that can happen, mishaps, and your vehicles have to be, of course, repaired. You have to repair your vehicles to move them up the vehicle condition track. Let me break down a little bit about what that all means, like if you need to heal your horses, because horses can also suffer injuries 
in this system. And you can actually replace vehicles with horses if you want to actually apply those to horses instead. So it has a lot of kind of utility beyond just strictly fantastic machines like the Rumble Butler or carriages or war wagons or chariots. There's a bunch of cool stuff you can kind of flip in and out. We really pride ourselves on the modularity of Zweihander and Mongosh, obviously, because it adheres to the same modular model. Obviously, you can see a, this is a Zeppelin, an aerostat, that lazing in the air with a with a gondola beneath it. But, um, you know, we, we wanted it to be the same. We wanted the combat system to be the same as vehicle combat, and that's why it's that way. So, Libel Alchemy. This is my second favorite chapter because there's so many cool things in here. And by the way, we are at 141 of 300 and if we look back here, 357. So there's a ton of stuff in here, a ton of things to expand your game that are all optional. And we believe very strongly when you release books, they need to be big and contain a lot of fun options. We're, we don't want to like bleed people for additional 250 page supplements. Like this seems so wasteful to me. It's just a, it, you know, and I'm not knocking on any RPG companies here, but I've just got this, you know, as a player and somebody who collects RPGs, as you can see across here, across my shelves, and this is only a part of my collection. I haven't unpacked yet because we're still remodeling our basement. But one thing I just, I just, don't like about some RPGs is they create supplement after supplement after supplement after supplement. And while it is a working model, I just feel that there's not enough content in them sometimes. And in particular, I grossly despise supplements that don't include an adventure to utilize the new stuff you put in that book. Like that is such a a bugaboo of mine, it, it frustrates me to no end. Like buying a core rule book with no adventure in the back, like why? So like in Zweihander, we included an adventure. And in fact, we included an adventure in Mongosh too. Even though, even though this is a supplement and optional, even though it is mostly player facing with some game master options, we included an adventure in it. And we made the book big because we wanted to include a lot of content for people to kind of, to go through, to pick and choose, to utilize, to figure out, do they like this at the table? Cool, adopt it. If they don't, do something else. So we did that here in Mongosh in 356 pages of this massive supplement. You know, the supplement's pretty thick. I mean, it's certainly, you know, it's it's pretty big. Um, but but let's get back to let's get back to what we're talking about beyond my personal bugaboos. Let's talk about the book itself. So once again, we're looking at a full page image by Dan Mandich. And this is John Blanche. Uh, John Blanche uh, is one of the well-renowned Games Workshop guys who worked on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay a long time ago. You, you saw him earlier actually in the professions up front. Um, he actually dominates this page. This is him painting this wretched woman into the twisted version of, version of the Mona Lisa, excuse me, into the twisted version of the Mona Lisa. And of course, he, he's got his uh, apprentice in the background. We talk about making etheric fluid. Etheric fluid is important for creation of golems, which, yes, in... Mongosh, you can create golems. Super cool. Um, you can make new decoctions utilizing Primo Materia. So by harvesting plants, minerals, and creature Primo Materia based on their abundance, their rarity rather, you can create decoctions that actually amplify combat, brawn, agility, perception, intelligence, willpower, and fellowship. So it's kind of a loose, quote, potion system you can utilize to make decoctions that give you temporary bonuses. And they're fun. They're really fun. Um, but you can't drink too many or else you become intoxicated. Uh, so you have kind of a hard limit on how many you can, you can quaff and drink at once. And this kind of plays toward a bit of our love of the Hexer, or as it's known in the United States, the Witcher. Um, we wanted to create a premium material, uh, a system that allows Hexers to utilize kind of similar potions. And anyone can do this, mind you. This can be done by anybody with alchemy uh, or a, access to a lab and such in use of void salts. But then, of course, playing off that, there's some dice poker in here. Like, there's actually a sub-game that you can play around your table utilizing your characters in Mongosh, in Zweihander, to play a built-in bar game that uses, uses face d6s and you can roll skill tests to bump the table and alternate change the outcome of dice so um, it's a kind of fun thing we included 
um, obviously optional. We talk about the limits for decoctions once again. We talk about, you know, the cost for stuff if you buy it or sell it. Then we have mutagenic potions. Obviously, you can't become a hexer unless you undergo the trials. And part of that is by imbibing a mutagenic potion. And when you quaff it based on your age group, it for the difficulty writing, it'll determine what happens. Like, you can then become a hexer if you, if you take it. Uh, and some people will die by taking it, of course. Um, void salts, which are ways to enhance your alchemy. They are made utilizing royal water, and you guessed it, which stone essence. Um, and whenever you utilize them and you, whenever you drink or utilize void salts along the way uh, it, for alchemy, it can enhance the abilities of your alchemical properties. So we spoke earlier about witch fire, or in this case, witch stone, and there's actually a subsystem called witch science. This is kind of a bizarre fusion of alchemy and diabolical experimentation to produce a really unusual science. And unsurprisingly, the Skurzak are, are kind of the drivers of that subsystem, at least in, in, in world, I guess you could say. And they all start with witchstone essence, but they can create things like chitter champ root, like the ability to talk with animals, glass grenades that you can fill with poisons that explode outward, witch blight, and all these witch blights, this is really interesting. So Skurzak and Zweihander are built around the four humors. Uh, there are bilious Skurzak, there are Sanguine Skurzak, there are Phlegmatic Skurzak, there's a whole kind of thing around them where they, where those different kind of types of Skurzak embody a different kind uh, of humor. And I'm flipping to them right now in Zweihander real quickly so I can show that to you because, because uh, within the world of Zweihander, Right, you get your Skurzak, your bilious, you know, you get your brood mothers, your phlegmatic, your choleric, and whatnot. Within the world of Zweihander and Mongosh, different types of Skurzak can produce different types of witch blight. Like bilious witch blight is really good to help you survive survival to, to help you for survival and toughness tests. Choleric witch blight makes you better at intimidate and guile tests. Phlegmatic skur phlegmatic witch blight. Makes it better for education and scrutinized tests. Makes you smarter. Sanguine witch blight makes you better at awareness and scrutinized tests. And of course, it has a subsystem to create your own witch blight. So you can create your own witch blights. And then, of course, we go back to witch science weaponry. This is how to actually make witch fire and utilize these weapons and how to create witch slime to basically dissolve things instantly. And how to use witch stone essence to meditate and so on and so forth. There's a lot of really cool stuff like witch stone tokens, which uh, can be crushed and snorted to, to, to uh, succeed skill tests for incantation, and they're worth money. Because uh, it assumes that the underworld of the Skurzak, they have a, their own economy ran by witch, witch stone. And, the, and those witch stone stones, obviously, are not, just, you're not carrying on like huge hunk of rocks. They're carrying around little tokens, like little, little bitty tokens uh, that they put in their pockets. Um, so, let's move on to some stuff uh, that also expands out diseases, disorders, poisons, and treatments. So, King's Disease, a new disease. It's really freaking bad. Um, the Unwalkable Disease. I think that King King Henry, that is the King Henry the Fourth. I want to say, suffered from, from the walking disease. We include the King's Disease in here. Tree Man Syndrome. Basically becoming petrified uh, through use of magic and crazy stuff. War Fever. Like a new, a new disease. And of course we have disorders like, what does it mean to be possessed by a restless spirit or a demon? Like, what does that mean in game mechanics perspective? Well, here's a really cool, interesting artwork. As a total aside to what we're about to talk about that's super interesting, there's another piece of artwork by Dan Mandich uh, that's really evocative. So we're talking about what it means to be possessed by a demon. And this actually talks about, as a disorder, like how that actually works in game. And it's really, really fun. We actually have a character right now in our Queen of Embers game that is actually possessed by a demon. And then we talk about Witchstone Addiction. And there's, of course, a meme um, from the internet because that's, that's what I do. Uh, Witchstone Addiction is an addiction you can gain from taking too much Witchstone. But we also have some interesting new poisons called Inebriants. And as opposed to these poisons being used on others, these are poisons you use on yourself, like Devilweed, Satan's Cabbage. Um, and there are different types of devil weed, obviously. Ruderalis, indica, 
and sativa. Green Fairy. Uh, I think we all kind of know what this is. It's pretty much absinthe, but it's a meta. It's it is a it a meta magical absinthe. So all of these inebriants have something quirkiness about them. It doesn't necessarily reflect the real world, but uh, is quirky about them in a sense that you can grow addiction to coffee or <laughs> Green Fairy or Madame Geneva, which is gin. And we actually have this really interesting aside about a real machine that exists in the real world called the Puss and Mew machine. It's a really interesting little story that you can utilize the story and create your own Puss and Mew machines to sell Madame Geneva in cities. We have tobaccos, obviously different types of tobaccos uh, in the book. And we've updated our black market goods sheet here with their cost by dose throughout here. And you can prepare your own inebriants. Obviously, you want to be able to prepare your own, uh, your own devil weed. <laughs> you want to be able to grow it in your backyard. Um, you want to be able to make your own Madame Geneva. Has a whole thing about that. Then we have finally new treatments, and this is the one I'm really excited about. Like you can use leeches now. They have leeches have an actual implication in the game uh, to help you resist disease and poison. You can perform hypnosis. Hypnosis actually allows you to restore people's dis or ignore disorders. You basically, by undergoing therapy, you can ignore your character's disorders temporarily. Uh, and depending on how many chaos ranks you have, you are more likely to succeed to hypnotize somebody the more chaos ranks they have because that means they're more susceptible to hypnosis. Which is really cool. So we are moving on to Liber Daemonum. And this is a chapter that talks about what demons are. Now, I think that when you hear the word demon, you think D-E-M-O-N. Like, oh, like dudes with horns and crazy stuff like that. And sure, you're going to see some demons with horns and crazy stuff like that. But when we say demons, we mostly mean forbidden gods. Gods that have been either lost to time, have been outlawed by inquisitors, or forgotten. And we talk about what the nature of demon worship really means in the world of Zweihander. Like I said before, if you worship a demon, if you're an occultist to a demon, you're not wearing horn helmets, black robes, and your face is marked with blood and sigils, and you're certainly not gathered on a table to raise your glass with your other occultist to toast to chaos. Instead, you're like a normal citizen. You're a miller, a stoneworker, a merchant, a community leader. You are participating in church and prayer of the local gods, albeit uttering devotion to demons in the church's privy, or you're closing your curtains to worship them when the sun goes down. Like These are not necessarily evil or even chaotic gods. And you're going to find out what I mean by that in just a few moments, because demons have aspects, meaning every demon has three aspects that represents what they want their worshipers to exhibit in the material realm. So let's take a look at this example, the 13, or sorry, let's actually just take a look at the Black Lodge, because this one's fun. Their aspects are depraved, vexing, and xenophobic, xenophobic rather. And whenever you become a, an occultist of a demon, you actually replace your order alignment with one of these aspects. And providing that you operate within the realm of that aspect, when you do things that normally be considered corruptive acts, you don't gain corruption due to it. In fact, demons specifically want to ensure that their worshipers do not act toward chaos, because acting toward chaos does not further the, does not further their ends. Instead, it disrupts it. What they want you to work toward is their aspect. So, if you worship the outsider, you're either going to be anarchic. Uh, anarchic, mutinous, or nihilistic. And and if you work toward those aspects, the demon's power is realized, and your power grows with that demon as you raise your aspect rings. Because remember, in Zweihander, whenever you uh, grow in order rings, you eventually get a fate point. The difference is, for if you worship a demon, now you, that you have aspect ranks. If you grow in ten ranks and aspects, you gain a demonic gift. And we'll show you those here briefly. But we actually have a breakdown of all the different gods, like as an example, or demons rather. The Black Lodge uh, is not a thing or a, 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 uh, a god it's, or, or a demon for the matter. It's a place. It's a place beyond our world. And it's made from the ossified bones of the dead fey gods. It's a place, a, a place that you can visit. 
uh, where a delegate called the Twilight Walker uh, represents its proxy. And of course, it's a is naturally, unsurprisingly, it is a representation is drawn from Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks is obviously, you know, a seminal work. I feel David Lynch, and it is kind of brought through forth in an interesting, intriguing way here in Mangosh. So each of the demons will have its own aspects spelt out, and each guy will then presume to show its altars and its aspects. And you move on so on through all these guys. And I don't want to spoil anything because these are super, super cool to read. I think you'll really like them. You know, in retrospect, I wish we had done all of our gods this way. All of the gods in Zviahandr, the steward, the martyr, the learner, um, would have been really cool. And we may do that eventually in like some sort of expanded book. Um, but, you know, for now, uh, those who worship demons, who have a covenant with the god, with these demons, uh, and they embrace one of these aspects. Obviously, this is the Prince of Pleasure, which, you know, if you look on this side, it looks like something very, very holy, like something you would see, you know, in the church. But when you open the reliquary, there is obviously the demonic half uh, of the Prince of Pleasure in both sides uh, of the Prince. And there's some rather suggestive imagery in there if you look closely enough, but I'll leave that to you to find. The Prince of Violence, the Slavering Maw, it's a crazy looking altar. The 13, not a demon, but 13 demons uh, that represent a whole, a council of demons, if you will. And then the Witch Queen. As I spoke about before, whenever you grow in aspect ranks, you can gain demonic gifts. And as you gain them, you gain chaos ranks permanently, and you get a gift randomly. It is a random thing. Demons are a fickle bunch, and even though, unlike the gods, uh, they demons are very active in this world because they're trying to reestablish themselves in the material realm. So they take a much more active hand, meaning if you grow an aspect ring, you get some of these crazy, crazy looking demonic gifts, which are all very, very different based on the demon. And they're not all good. As an example, you could gain a true name. You can literally gain a true name, just like a just like a uh, you know a demon or a, or a higher or lower demon or supernatural creatures. Uh, or you may get something that's totally different, like Chanty, Chanty of the Wood. You treat rural, uh, you never treat rural areas as hard terrain, but you treat urban areas as hard terrain. Um, you you get all these crazy things that happen, and these gifts require you to incant to call them out. So you must always have the ability to speak when taking advantage of these gifts, and it varies. Like here are the endless gullets. We look at they have gut thinker. Lead Belcher, Manslayer, you know, Wall Crusher, Mark of the Endless Gullet, all kinds of stuff, you know, Hell Furnace, the Prince of Change, the Outsider, these are demon these are actual like Abyssal Princes, the Abyssal Prince of Decay, the Abyssal Prince of Pleasure, and all their crazy, crazy gifts like Suicidal Blonde, Suicide Blonde, and Saturnine Musk, and Pincer of Pain and Pleasure, and Horn of Potency, like all kinds of really interesting things. Beguiling Congress. All these demonic gifts, the gifts of the Prince of Violence, you know, like living sutures. You can heal yourself with these sutures that live upon you. It's, it's the craziest thing. Uh, but they all have their own unique little demonic gifts that they give to their occultists, guaranteeing that you are a follower, meaning you use covenant magic, which brings us to the next chapter for covenant magic. But we're about page 183, and I think we're going to probably finish Covenant Magic first, and then I'll close up this video and we'll finish out the Mongosh walkthrough with part three tomorrow. So, in Zweihander, we already know there are two types of magic, and this is pretty, pretty obvious to anyone who's played in a role-playing game. There's, Demo there's arcane magic, and there's divine magic. Arcane magic meaning do you take it from somewhere? Do you steal it from somewhere? Or divine magic, which means you are calling upon a god to give you power. In, in Mangosh, there's a new, a new tradition of magic called covenant magic. 
Not only are its spells more destructive, but come up with a steep price, the cost of one's soul. You must give up a part of yourself to, to curry favor with a single demonic master. And every demon has its own different demands. And you enter packs with them. And you record your spells into a codex. And there's all this crazy kind of interesting fiction behind it that basically tells you that you literally are worshiping your forgotten god and they're giving you powers beyond ren renown. And in fact... While the arcane and divine magic spells have some sense of familiarity, although they do have their own dark twist, covenant magic all is twisted. It's all very different. It's not, quote, more powerful than magic in Zweihander, Revised Core Rulebook. Instead, it is vastly different in the sense of the way it manifests. There's not really a lot of damage-dealing type of spells in this. Um, we repeated some of the stuff in here for casting magic, just as a reminder for players. But Covenants of the Black Lodge. Between two worlds, Delahan's Curse, Fey Requiem, Ossified Winds, Paul of Night, Restore the Lodge, The Sleeper Awakens, Twilight Walker, and Wood Whisper. There are all these really interesting kind of Fey spells that do all of this crazy, crazy, crazy stuff uh, that is literally kind of off the reservation, when it, or so to speak, uh, for purposes of using magic. It's so vastly different uh, than arcane and divine magic. And I'm hoping that, you know, you can pause this video and look a little bit more at the details of these spells because they're really, really intriguing. Um, I really invite you to buy the book and look. And I think the book is still like $32, $38 on Amazon right now. It's normally $55. Like, I don't want to spend too much time on these spells. But, you know, there's there's nine new spells, nine new covenant spells for every single god uh, in this book. Every single demon in this book. Gout Shanks, Iron Gut, Victuals of Viscera, Slaughterhouse, Slurp Marrow. I mean, they're very, very evocative, and they're meant to evoke the aspects of the demon, like those of the Hell Furnace. Bow Before Me, Brittle Bone Curse, Hell Worker Stick, Malign Subjugation, Obsidian Promise, Primordial Disruption, Salt and Sulfur, and the Inverted Doom. Like, all of these are really, really evocative in that sense. Right there, I believe, is a spell that, that spell we were looking at before, the Inverted Doom. That's it. That's the Inverted Doom. Because it spells in Zweihander, there aren't nine levels of spells. There's basically petty ma there's generalist magic, which is shared among everybody. But then spells go from petty, lesser, and greater. And they grow in such steep contrast in power uh, that spells like this that are greater are almost inexplicable. They're world ruining. Magic is built that way in Zvyander to bend and sometimes break the rules. Because magic should bend and break the rules. And unlike d d there aren't spells that necessarily counter every single spell. Like, if you get diseased in D&D, there's a, a, you know, a cure disease spell. Zvyander is not like that at all, whatsoever. And that's done by, by, uh, by choice. So, Covenant to the Outsider, Blasphemy, Contempt of the Abyss, Deny the Princes, Rend to Chaos, The Other, Through the Abyss. Like, really cool, interesting. And, of course, right here is the Worshipper of the Outsider, the Opener of the Way. A throng of men and women bowing before them as they are bending reality around them with the shards of reality. Deny the princes. Remember, the outsider is the abyssal prince who fights against the other abyssal princes. Um, so you have all these different spells, obviously. Coming to the Prince of Change, you know, we look at abyssal deportation, unholy vision, warp reality, psychic enslavement, guttering flame. Um, really interesting. And you can see that there's one of this, these occultists praying to one of these gods beyond. The Prince of Decay has things like Carbuncle of Horror, Carnival of Pestilence, Feces Fetter, Pungent Godsend, Spew of Ominous Corruption, The Fifth Trumpet and Unseeming Visage. Like the Prince of Decay is really intriguing and specifically sets out to spread sickness and disease, although beneath a smile. They're not just walking around like in disease robes and spreading disease. I mean, that that's sort of like... Stark contrast, good, evil, order, chaos stuff doesn't exist in Zweihander. It's a mature, it's a much more mature storytelling. It's about like how 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 the spread of these things are more insidious beneath the surface, and the professions and the covenant magic kind of manifests in that way. The whole book manifests in that way. Come to the Prince of Pleasure, Etheric Strapato, Dance of the Devil, Fifty Shades of Pain, Florentine Kiss. 
Profusion of Piss, Succubus Incubus. Like these are, of course, attuned to the crazy spells that uh, those who are cultists to the Prince of Pleasure uses. Like Florentine Kiss. You can only guess what that does. Your tongue grows to a, to a grotesque coil at your feet and can be used as a one-handed range weapon with entangling, ineffective, and throwing qualities. And uh, it utilizes your combat, ba your incantation skills of combat base skill to hit. So you, it's pretty grotesque. Slavering Ball, Bad Moon Rising. Here's a Bad Moon Rising. Go for Broke, Glasgow Kiss, Hut Hut Hike, Odds and Sods, War, The Big Stomp, and Get Out of Here. And uh, Brain Burger. A bunch of new interesting spells for a very brutish and simple minded demon. The 13, we spoke about them before. It is a council of 13 demons who are worshipped. They give you spells such as Perfect Camouflage, Horde of Vermin, Witch Fire Discharge, Warp Step, The Black Hunger, Bubonic Whirl. Like all these really cool, interesting spells that all do really, really neat things. Um, coming up to the Witch Queen, which I believe is our last demon we'll cover. Abjure Spirit, Consult the Spirits, Frock of Ice, Frost Kiss, Tempestari. The Rhyme Maidens, not Rhymes and the Buster Rhymes, but Rhymes and R-I-M-E, so cold, cold, ice. Rhyme Maidens worship the Witch Queen and utilize these, these cool spells, Maleficium. We get a lot. And actually, we get a repeat of the image here that we showed earlier, which is uh, the board Rhyme Maiden. So we will conclude Liber Umbrarum, the Book of Shadows, with rituals. And there's some fun new rituals, obviously, in this book, such as Bond Mithril, which we spoke about before. Construct golems. You can make your own golems in this game. You can exercise demons and spirits. You can use fortune telling. You can declare oaths to a peerage, like the Knights of the Round Table. Or trace sigils, like we spoke earlier about signs that hexers use, uh, or witchers use in the United, the U.S. version of Hexer, you can uh, use sigils in this as well, utilizing different elements. So, bond mithril. Basically, how do you weave mithril into things that you create? Very straightforward. Constructing golems. You can create your own golems that either, one, resemble creatures already in the book, or two, custom create your own golems. Custom create your own monsters, because what we haven't shown you yet which is the back half of the book. They're only on page 212, 213. The back half of the book is actually for the Game Master. Because it teaches the Game Master to make creatures and NPCs. And with this spell, you can create customized golems from the ground up utilizing those same rules. So those rules are useful for players as well. They're just as useful. And you actually use, we spoke earlier about like how you took a, 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 the, the etheric fluid. This is what you use to heal golems with. And you can, of course put contingencies upon them. Like, you can pass your personality into the golem upon death, um, which kind of plays towards some interesting kind of story stuff. Like, we've seen old school D&D. &D. Like, how do you get your mind into a golem? Well, you can do it here. You can absolutely do it. And golems can take many different shapes, like animated brooms, um, automatons, dolls, um, you know, large, massive statues, animated skeletons. Like, you can create all these interesting things and each golem can be given different types of commands. Like petty golems, you observe, obey simple orders like open the door, sweep the floor, chatter like a disembodied teeth, rave till dawn, eat small rats in sight, play dead. But lesser golems can utilize more complex commands such as drive to the docks and bring back my goods, collect firewood and build a, a pyre for a witch. Kill anyone who trespasses and drag their corpses outside. Greater golems are almost completely autonomous and obey supremely complex commands and react accordingly. Such as, teach yourself to read but skip over anything you do not find interesting. Find me a cleric with white hair who has cheated a gambler and decide if he is guilty. Understand what it means to be alive and author a story of your experiences. So greater golems are kind of almost self-serving in that sense. And of course, through the penultimate contingency, you can then pass your spirit after you die into the golem. So kind of cool. But golems are oftentimes given to rage because as we know uh, in the story of the golem, uh, Judaic story, uh, the golem that, uh, that they create goes mad. Uh, it is out of control. But of course, they can eventually become awoken. So if you think about 
the we talk about Dr. Frankenstein and his creation, the modern Prometheus. The modern Prometheus kind of developed its own persona. It awoke. It became one of the awoken. And in fact, golems in this game can do that. Specifically, greater golems are oftentimes can do that. Um, so there's all kinds of neat stuff in there that once again we draw up on hammer horror, we draw up on um, you know, D&D stuff, some, and some make some interesting twists in there to make it truly unique for Zweihander, because what we didn't want to do is basically recreate what was already there in D&D, which is your iron golem, your bone golem, your flesh golem. We wanted you to give you freedom to create your own types of golems and give you the rules to custom, custom create your own types, utilizing the bestiary, the monster creation rules in the back of this book. That brings us to exorcism. So what does it mean to actually drive away a spirit from a host, an object, a house, a cup, a person, um, something that's possessed, a, a doll for that matter? Like, what does it mean to do that? Well, we talk about what true names mean and we talk about what call names are. Basically, call names, like as an example, like Asmodeus in D&D &D is known by hundreds of call names. We talk about what call names actually mean and how they can be used and, of course, how you speak true names and how those impact exorcism. Because exorcism kind of has a couple of things that you do. One, you try to coerce its true name, right, to learn its true name if you don't know it already, to coerce it to do so. And once you know its true name, then you can attempt to exorcise it. And you roll chaos, side, chaos dice to determine how you exorcise these creatures and things and buildings and, and objects. We move on to fortune telling, which is a pretty neat subsystem too. Like, how do people scry using a mirror or cauldron? How do they read the skull bones of somebody? How do they, you know, how do they uh, use rune stones or read the innards of chickens or use cards? Like we talk about, we actually not only talk about what fortune telling means and how to do it, but we talk about each of the types of fortune telling, like astrology in what success it means for them, what reagents are necessary. Cartomancy, palmistry, dream interpretation, scrying, scapulomancy, and so on and so forth. So there's actually types of fortune telling, because not every fortune teller reads cards or reads a crystal ball or whatever. There's different types we included in here so that you can really vary what fortune telling means in your Zwei Hunter and Mon Mongosh game. Oaths to the Peerage. Uh, this is actually a ritual where you can, where you can proclaim yourself a, one of the peerage of dominion, that of chaos or sovereignty, that of order. And based on that, you then get some really cool abilities like tapping into your alignment. Like you can tap into your alignments to uh, succeed skill tests by spending a fortune point. You get to utilize something that's permanently in place for your character once you undergo that. And this is really meant to exemplify what it meant whenever those who proclaim themselves to Arthur's, Arthur's, King Arthur's court from the Morte Arthur, like when Gawain pledged himself to Arthur, to Arthur, to Arthur, uh, in the round table. And this is how this is kind of realized. Like, what happened when somebody was trying to proclaim themselves to Mordred? Um, we utilize that so you can have some more traditional knightly tropes within your game. And of course, remember, rituals can be used by anybody, even if they don't have the special traits of arcane, divine, or covenant magic. Anybody can cast these using the incantation test, because once again, no skill is off limits in Zweihander. You may have to flip the results to succeed, but no skill is off limits. And you can utilize these rituals independent of being a caster. We end our chapter for Liber Umbrarum with Trace Sigil. And this is literally all of the signs, sign magic, as it's called in Witcher, that the Hexer can utilize. So when you evoke the Aether symbol, you have different intensities. The Ok symbol, the different intensities, and what they did, what they do. Same thing with Kaylee, which is Earth. Ignis, which is fire, obviously. Helios, which is sun. And Terra, which is uh, Earth. So I think Kaylee is psychokinetic. My apologies. Kaylee is psychokinetic. Terra is Earth. And there's all kinds of different things you can do because you actually have to learn new sigils. You don't get them all out the gate. 
you learn them and improve them, just like in the Witcher game. Um, we make, make no bones about it. This is literally meant for you to be able to play a Witcher or Hexer in your Zweihander game and utilize science. It is built that way specifically. Um, while skirting IP, obviously, because we don't want to infringe upon IP. But I, we just love the Hexer. Like, the books are so cool. And the games are so neat. We had to, like, put something in there that allows you to evoke that. Um, and, and, yeah, so, obviously, here's our Hexer image again. So, that that concludes part two of of the walkthrough from Mongosh. Uh, when we come back uh, tomorrow, we're going to start with Libra Malice, which is basically creating custom creatures because having another beast area for his winder would have been neat but what is better meaning a better experience for people playing this game is to be able to learn how to create your own stuff and as you can see with this image this this character that you've seen before an occult magician is creating her own creature from body parts and we're going to talk about what that means both as a game master and player in this section starting with page 223 when we come back so thank you all for watching this very long video i think it's an hour now after i stitched these two videos together um there's a lot to unpack a lot to learn obviously mongosh is a supplement for zvi hunter um it's really cool it comes out today september 10th i'm so excited for it it's it just took a ton of hard work from a number of really talented people to help realize my vision. And as I mentioned before, you know, it takes a village to raise children and, and, and it, takes, it takes a cult, a whole cult to make a book a reality. And all of these people who are, who are here, Tanner and Ken and Adam and Matt and Fiona and Jennifer and Ken and Deanne and, you know, Peter and Sammy and Sierra and all the playtesters and all the maps by, you know, by Peter Lattimore and all of our contributors' additional feedback, my wife, my son, our friends, the people in the industry, our backers from Kickstarter. There's so many people that, that, that contribute to making really cool games that just go unrecognized and we oftentimes gravitate toward the more notable personalities who make games. But the reality is, is that no matter how great of a game designer you may be, no matter how great of a creator you may be, you can't do it all on your own. Or I should say, a rare few are doing it on their own. But let's be honest, they need help because it's a lot of work. Anybody who's created something before, you know, knows it takes a lot of work to create your own RPG. And, and I, am, I am fortunate and blessed to have a group of very dedicated playtesters and to have worked for Angels and Camille Universal you know, as a, as my new publisher, right, uh, where I'm the executive creative director to basically run their, their RPG and games unit and to have all of these people from Grim Parallel Studios continue to contribute and write and draw and illustrate and edit and self-check and play test and do all of these things to make books like this, Mongosh, a reality. And, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't thank them. So, so thank, so thank you obviously to, to them and thank you all for listening to this video. I really hope um, that you find some inspiration in Mongosh. And then you'll give it a try if you're already a, a buyer of Zwei Hunter. If you haven't already bought Zwei Hunter, I think it's like $32. Mongosh is $38. I mean, basically you can get like thousands of hours of gameplay for less than $70. And, 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 and if you're already a uh, already own Mon already owns Zwei Hunter, Mongosh, you have to pick it up. I mean, not just because I created it, because I am very proud of what we've done here, uh, but because it really adds a lot of value. And I think the third video you're going to find, particularly as a game master, that there's a lot to love about Mongosh beyond the additional professions, beyond the new alchemy, beyond the vehicle combat, beyond all the new weapons, beyond all the magic. The really, really cool stuff for game masters is really in the back. Building your own unique creatures and NPCs on the fly and, and an amazing adventure called There's Something About Marie, read by Sammy Ucidolo and myself. So we'll talk about that in our next video. Thank you all once again. Thank you for your support. And remember, you can buy Mongosh uh, uh, at mongoshrpg.com or on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble or at Target or your local friendly gaming store, buy it wherever you want. Um, it's cheapest on Amazon, it's the quickest way to get it, but really support your local 
your favorite local gaming store if you can. Uh, thank you all so much again, and I will see you here tomorrow for our final video on Mongosh, where chaos awaits. Happy gaming.